Um, so Corona Y task time series um, is essentially uh, a, a subgroup of Corona Y, and we're primarily focused on using uh, the latest techniques in time series forecasting to forecast the tra trajectory of coronavirus. Um, Y also designing kind of a broadly applicable, applicable suite of deep learning for time series forecasting tools that uh, that can also work in other contexts uh, and, and solve uh, both humanitarian and business type problems. So um, our, we have four kind of main project, uh, project uh, or deliverables that I'll talk about in detail. Um, uh, even though like our first one's the only really COVID-19 specific one, the other three all like play into our COVID forecast. Um, and they were, and the good thing about them is that they were would work in other kind of contexts too, which is why they're valuable for I believe a wide range of businesses and other um, sorts of entities. But I will get into our actual COVID stuff first, so we'll look at this um, our COVID county projections uh, dashboard. Um, so one of the main problems with current COVID models, um, and this was actually highlighted by the former U.S. chief data scientist is they work mainly kind of at this very high resolution. They're either at like a state level or a country level, and they don't give a lot of insight into how a specific county uh, would deal with the virus um, or, or even lower granularity would be good. And we are looking to work towards that, but right now we're primarily fo focused at the county level. Um, uh, the other, major problem is they don't really leverage this kind of observed data uh, very well. So um, as he says here, like a lot of them are based on like pure, pure kind of statistical, like theoretical, like visions of the virus uh, and don't actually leverage the, the actual COVID data we have. Um, and yeah, and they don't, uh, and a lot of them don't consider kind of like uh, demographic distributions uh, and, and things like that. So the good news is actually our models do a lot of this stuff already. So um, our models are specifically aimed at forecasting at the county level. Um, our model forecasts, uh, when, when they're deployed to production, they will be updated daily with the most recent COVID data. And we plan on re having a system to automatically retrain our models on a weekly basis. Um, uh, also kind of uh, a core idea of our models is that like we're incorporating a wide variety of data sources. So um, we've spent a lot of time constructing a very uh, good COVID data lake and are still kind of uh, working on that with our data kind of engineering subgroup at Corona Y. So we plan on incorporating um, additional sources of data such as stuff from, um, you know, geospatial um, textual data from social media and other stuff, um, symptom surveys, all to improve our model's ability to forecast using this full range of data sources. Um, so in terms of that, what this will actually look like in practice uh, is we plan to have a, a, a online web app dashboard um, that essentially would answer the following questions. What will, um, you know, uh, our county's hospitalizations and case counts look like 16 days from now. Um, also, we're looking to do like um, basically these types of causal inference. So basically, if my county took this action and implemented this policy, how would that affect the projections and case numbers? Also, what we're looking to say is like provide interpretability for both epidemiologists and uh, public policy uh, people um, uh, as in saying, what are the factors that like the model thinks are currently driving COVID spread in your community? Um, finally, we do have plan to have some support for counterfactual kind of interest uh, inference. So like, you know, historically, if my county had done this at this point in time, uh, what would our case numbers and hospitalizations look like now? Um, and then uh, also as kind of an interesting thing is that we do have mobility data. Um, so actually businesses could make use of the mobility data to, um, that we plan on having uh, to see how that might uh, impact their businesses and things like that. And we do plan on maybe even training some models that based on a policy 
would forecast kind of the change in mobility um, in different places. So uh, this was obviously valuable for uh, a wide group of people, mainly epi epidemiologists, public policy people, even business owners, and also just people concerned about the virus in general. Um, so that's kind of our main COVID-19 uh, related deliverable. Um, the, our next three things are kind of things that all play into delivering that, but then can also be generalized to other industries and areas. Um, so the, the next main thing is our time series forecasting um, platform. Um, and so with that, uh, um, that basically, um, wide variety of industries, humanitarian efforts, etc., being able to accurately forecast temporal, various temporal trends is crucial. Um, as you know, this re repository previously forecasted things like uh, flash, uh, flash floods, droughts, and things like that. So that's obviously a big one. Um, health, other medicine and health things, there's a ton of things um, that, that could be done, we just don't have the data for. But you know, patient responses to treatments over time, readmissions to hospitals, um, OR util operating room utilization, um, you know, things like in agriculture, like crop yield, crop demand, you know, milk production. Uh, tons of stuff in retail. I actually worked at a, um, a retail store a while ago. One of our big things was for forecasting demand for specific product SKUs to be able to determine hourly stocking. Um, manufacturing, finance, uh, I mean, basically almost every kind of industry or group, there's probably some need for models that uh, can really forecast and predict uh, temporal trends uh, very well. Um, but you know, like what I've seen is a lot of companies really struggle to get good temporal models. Um, time series forecasting and predictions actually a very hard task. Uh, and uh, part of the problem is is that uh, that particularly when doing kind of like deep learning for it, there's just so many different hyperparameters and other things. But at the same time, deep learning can be very effective in it because it can come synthesize multiple kind of modalities of data you wouldn't normally synthesize. For instance, here we're looking at synthesizing geospatial data, um, demographic data, you, you, using these autoencoders into the temporal forecast. Um, and similarly, like, I think that a similar thing could work really well for forecasting demand in stores, like uh, using, you know, those like autoencoders to form a county embedding and even using geospatial or, or even traffic data to kind of uh, improve the accuracy of, you know, what our stuff will be bought. So um, deep learning does have a lot of benefits over kind of basic statistical models in this area, particularly at, uh, when you acquire a lot of data sources. Um, nevertheless, it remains really hard, particularly to discover the causality and kind of trends in your data. So um, Q flow forecast, um, so yeah, as I said, originally this was used for flow forecasting in COVID, uh, but it's now been applied to COVID and actually a f some other interesting problems. Uh, the idea is we have basically a very um, unified, coherent platform of all the model, of all the different state of the art time series models, loss functions, um, and we have you know different layers we can swap in and out for both forecasting, classification, even just anomaly detection. Um, we have very, very specific documentation where it shows how easy it is to swap out and test different hyperparameters. And we employ the latest kind of um, interpretability methods as those have historically kind of been a weakness for um, deep learning and time series because you, know, uh, you have to be able to just explain your decisions to stakeholders um, in the business. And then the other idea is to use these easy, to use transfer learning through config files and really leverage the power of tra positive transfer across temporal dependencies. Um, that's also kind of one of our research objectives, but it will play a major role in the platform in that uh, people will be able to just leverage transfer across a bunch of different time series very easily to improve their results, just like how everyone does it kind of like with ImageNet nowadays. Um, so also a core part, as I was saying, was this idea for flow forecast is this ability to synthesize multiple modalities. So we'll, the REPA will include methods to embed this um, 
different types of uh, modalities and feed, feed it into a time series prediction problem. Um, and then it will also, uh, yeah, just make it really easy to synthesize all those different types of, you know, geospatial, textual, um, other imagery data into your model's forecast um, and, you know, leverage those. It'll also make it easy to incorporate kind of multi-horizon temporal forecasts where you might have uh, some data coming in at the daily level, some at the weekly level, um, and things like that. Um, for instance, if you're like predicting like, I don't know, like, uh, you know, patient response to treatments for, you know, a tumor or something, you might only have uh, images of that on like a monthly basis, but you might have other things like patient vitals on the like weekly basis or something like that. So um, there's, there's, there's really a lot of these kind of multi-horizon problems where, um, you know, in retail too, where you might have, uh, you know, just uh, updated like shipment info for on a monthly period, but then you have the demand sales on a daily period. So, um, so, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of those potential use cases. Um, so that was kind of the first two. Um, the third is designing kind of an overall multivariate data lake and waste storage place. Um, so key idea here is that uh, public data can enhance performance of forecasts. Um, like a lot of, for instance, a lot of things, even just like predicting, like, uh, like if like, for instance, uh, a, an appointment someplace will be canceled or not, uh, whether data can play a huge role. Also predicting, like obviously if you're predicting rides um, or traffic, whether it could play a role. Similarly, actually to um, with COVID, COVID's actually broke down a lot of current time series forecasting models because it's such an anomaly. So in a sense, actually having that case data and other stuff in a central kind of uh, data lake that people could even just join to their time series data would be really useful because then they might get better performance out of their forecast models. Um, so the idea here is, um, but, but yeah, there's kind of a problem in uh, dealing with that data now because a lot of it is really a pain to join together. You might have different date times um, uh, and stuff like that. Um, also, as I said per before with the transfer idea, um, you want to uh, you want to maybe le leverage existing model weights. So the idea here is to have this really cohesive multivariate time series data lake, which could be used for transfer learning, joining time series together to improve your models. It would have clear data dictionaries, standard date times, and pre-built queries um, to make it easy um, and see if it would join per, uh, and improve the performance of the model. And similarly, um, we'd have a store repository of kind of model weights that could be used as a starting point. Um, didn't quite finish that slide. Uh, but uh, uh, the, I do think actually probably unlike with NLP, um, some of the like transfer in the time series forecasting case will be only from like time series. So there probably won't be just like one general weight thing. So like people could even like browse the most relevant weights, pre-trained weights and see which they think would be most relevant for their task and trial kind of a plethora of those. Um, that's kind of what people already do on the BERT website actually, um, even a bit for NLP. Um, and then also a native kind of integration with uh, flow forecast. Um, so flow forecast would easily be able to pull from this uh, temporal data lake, um, which I'm thinking right now would probably be on BigQuery. Um, but anyway, so that's the third. The fourth is um, obviously plays into these other two, but it's this idea of having a kind of rapid experimentation platform that moves away from the tediousness and problems with reproducibility with notebooks. So as of now, around 87% of machine learning models will never make it to production. Uh, there's pro mainly this actually centers around problems with reproducibility, deployability. Um, there are some thing reasons for that we can't control, like uh, poorly aligned with business interests, but we can help uh, uh, address the problems with reproducibility and uh, deployability. So the idea is we have an AI, AI overall AI experimentation framework, which would be compatible both with our main repo and other popular repos not even related to time series. Um, basically, experiments would be spun up based on a GitHub PR. 
um, after they're spun up, the there would essentially be um, log to weights and bias um, um, linked to there. So that it would automatically link that to the PR. Um, and then basically, uh, the nice thing about this is all communication with the experiment results, etc., uh, would all take place in the PR, and you'd see the config file um, quickly. And then the idea is the PR would be merged to like dev, which would contain a historical record. And then basically, if the performance is good, um, then basically there would be a prod branch um, where the model is where you would merge then the PR and the model, and then that, the basically the ensuing GitHub action would take care of the whole deployment process and basically then just deploy the model um, to actually run on production on some cloud provider. Um, I'm still working out the, how the exact details of that would look, but uh, but that that's the idea. So um, yeah, I didn't finish our team page. Um, I don't know if Arthur wants it, but that's kind of like the overview of um, the stuff. So. Um, does anyone have any questions or feedback on that? Well, nothing in particular, but I think it, it looks good and it'll make sense to me. Uh, yeah, I think the especially the contribution with respect to it being uh, a library that would be available for you know, some like different time series problems will be especially like a, I think it will be an especially strong point setting point. Okay, um, yeah, I th I think that is a good direction. Um, yeah, obviously to aim in and uh, yeah, I mean I think it is true. Um, like. Uh, Definitely that uh, even though we are focused on COVID, we can do like solve some of these more broadly applicable issues, hopefully. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to get across. And, uh, and yeah, I think building really a good open source community and open source kind of of data lake around the project uh, would be really useful. Um, so, um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the core deliverables. Um, I'm, I am creating like kind of pages for each of them that will feature some of the info. Um, um, but yeah, uh, yeah, so uh, that's kind of the main stuff, uh, you know, I'd, I wanted to present quickly. Um, anyone have any, I mean, it's kind of a broad outline, but anyone have any questions about how some of it would work or anything like that. Um, one thing that I remember you mentioned to sort of look retrospectively, uh, if some policies were applied, how uh, that would have affected the cases. Uh, do we have we started on that? Is there an idea like how we are going to approach that? Um, so yeah, the, there is, there is some idea of how to approach it, though we haven't started on it. Uh, there was a whole section on at ICML actually, um, and Kriti might be able to comment to, 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 on this too on essentially counterfactual inference and uh, causal inference. And so, like one of the things was was being able to do like counterfactual stuff. There were a couple papers, so it probably initially required digging into those papers. Um, and discovering that, um, so um, yeah, but I, I'd have to look over the those papers a bit more. But there are there are techniques for that type of counterfactual inference. Um, they have their drawbacks, but uh, each have drawbacks and positives. But there are ways of doing it. So, um, but yeah, we haven't started. Okay, cool. It just sounds very interesting. So I just wanted to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, there was a particularly nice paper that was especially for uh, causal inference for time series methods. It was very nice. I Again, I, I downloaded it somewhere. I could share it in a bit, maybe. But I don't remember the name of the paper. Or maybe I'll just add it to the, to the wiki page. So if someone wants to look up the paper, they can. But uh, yeah, ICML had a lot of fun papers regarding causal inference this year. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but i think it will be a, it will be an interesting challenge to implement them because or actually haven't looked into it enough i don't know if a lot of them have ready made available uh by to which implementations yeah but yes it's an interesting challenge yeah and i mean i think that gets to the core of a lot of stuff related to covid too because like um well covid and a lot of problems because people like uh and many times like i mean it's good to have a forecast a plan but you also kind of want to know oh if i did this action like how would this have played out differently um somewhere like even like in ad tech that's a common thing where like oh if i boosted this ad like you know how many more clicks it would get uh so like over time so like that that's kind of a very common problem um, and it's a hard problem cuz it's essentially like you know as as i said the casual thing and there are lots of co-founders um but yeah if we could make progress on that uh i think that would be very uh valuable um um but yeah I, I, so i don't know if that would like go up in like version 1 of our dashboard or something but um i think maybe version 1 would just start with the basic oh this is the forecast with the model assuming that that's pretty good but then we would hopefully add that like over time in like like a version 2 or 3 so yeah that's yeah so um i just had a question have we incorporated the em- embeddings into the forecast yet or is that uh, or is that something that's yet to be done um that's something i have a pr to start on it but uh as i said it's uh somewhat complicated um so uh i'm i'm kind of tr- i will try to work on that in a bit um but there there is also a question like to like just in software engineering terms of how much code we want to try to use or if we should create like an entirely different training loop for that from the time series which might be easier or if we could have just a generalized uh training loop um so there there are some design questions to see like oh to think about in terms of maintainability um but yeah if you want to talk about that I'd be open to discussing it right definitely so um i don't i haven't thought about it a lot but we're completely right how it's going to be integrated as going to be going to be a question in um so perhaps after i'm done with the probability um, pr i could jump on that but then i guess there's also the remaining issue of the, um od in neural network so i don't know which is more important in terms of priority working yeah so i uh, uh, i mean actually assuming that these lever models keep working well um neural ode was isn't that high priority um the neural ode is kind of i mean i mean we do want to get it in eventually because i think it's a good technique but uh the main, the main reason it was high priority was just because uh for a while it looked like all of our methods weren't weren't generalizing so Um now some of our methods do seem to be generalizing to those events plus uh, I expect hopefully your probabilistic stuff will hopefully make that even better so uh yeah so yeah I mean the neural ODE would only be a priority if like uh, <laughs> the our models start failing so yeah. right now that makes sense also it's going to be like like I said it's going to be an intensive process because I guess before we deployed we don't want to what exactly it's doing and I have a rough idea but then i mean understanding it completely will take a bit of time but yeah okay cool so then once the probability stuff is done perhaps i'll jump on the uh, on, we can discuss what to do with the how to integrate the and stuff yeah yeah cool okay so um yeah so uh yeah so that's the main stuff uh Um yeah I know David you were wondering if I had links to those pages right or Um yeah like were there just screenshots of stuff that's not on any website or is it Um so 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 we do have some pages detailing some of the stuff I I created a page for the dashboard um just a little bit ago Um also for the dashboard if uh since that will be priced something hopefully our models are good and we can start working on that some soon um 
Is there anyone, anyone know anyone in Corona Y? I know like Mike Honey, we'd probably pull in for visualization, but anyone who's really good with kind of web app development in general or. What exactly do you want them to do, that person? Well, well, so we, uh, so this is all going to be deployed as a, into like a web application. So like uh, most of us here, um, at least that I know of, are primarily uh, data science and modeling people. But if we had someone who it was good with like designing a user interface and like, uh, you know, JavaScript and all that uh, hodgepodge of stuff that goes into a web app, we we essentially just design the back end service and then they'd like create the user interface that's, you know, nice and usable for uh, EPIs or public policy people. And that would essentially display our predictions and the relevant you know, trends and stuff. Okay, so you need someone to build the front end and the dashboard that people look at? Yeah, so someone to essentially build out the front end uh, the front end kind of web application in the dashboard. Um, uh, I, I mean, we'll stand up probably the back end service. Um, that, that shouldn't be that hard. That obviously generates the predictions, but then we need someone to build the essentially the user interface and the front end of the web app, which people would actually, you know, use. So. Um, and then how soon do you want them to start? Um, it, it, it doesn't need to be um, immediately. Uh, I mean, we're still working on validating the models, but the way this is going to work is we're going to validate the model a bit longer than once we're confident it works. We're going to write the back end service that's going to deploy the model. Um, probably as part of that rapid experimentation framework, uh, as I was saying. Uh, We'll write that backend service that will like essentially package up the model and ship it, uh, and then write out the the predictions from it. And then, uh, and then yeah, and then w once we have that, um, yeah, we we'd be looking to just like have that dashboard, then take those predictions, display them. Though some of it could potentially be done in parallel too. So, they if they could start sooner, that would be good because then we could just like even create like a dummy set of like predictions and just have them get it ready. So when the prod stuff is ready, everything would go quickly. Okay, um, I, I understand. Yeah, um, I, I just didn't know. I know, I thought we had some front end or UX people around Corona Y, but uh, um, but yeah, uh, I haven't seen any of them recently. Um, okay, yeah, so. Um, yeah, I think Task VT, uh, or, yeah, I think Task VT has some front, front end people in it, but I don't know how much bandwidth they have currently. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, is there you know, maybe we could have? Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe. so we could have, sorry. Oh, no, I, you, you can go ahead. I was just. Uh, no, I was just going to say, so yeah, if we need, if we don't need someone immediately, perhaps we could ask someone from there once they're free, but then again, it depends on how much time it has. Okay. Do you know what's task VT pretty much merged into the literature review or is they still a separate kind of team or is everyone on literature review now? So it's, mm, uh, so I think it's got merged with the, uh, not merged, there's quite a lot of overlap with the knowledge graph group, but then I don't know how busy they are right now. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I just don't know which teams are really still active now, so. Um. I can, yeah, I can see that there, there's some conversation every, yeah, there's, there's, I think there's a, by weekly meeting at least, and I know that much, but I don't know how much work is being, uh, how much how, yeah, how much work is being done right now. But I know someone posted something about having the first pass of a page up, I guess, or, or first pass of some some sort of UI up uh, a week ago. So I yeah, I'm not entirely sure. We'll have to ask, I guess. 
Okay. Yeah, I know knew we were doing that meeting for a while, the try and general team meeting, but then it kind of fell apart. I mean like the Corona Y group meeting. Uh but that, that fell apart kind of. Um Okay, so yeah, so uh, I think that covers most of yeah, pretty much everything I was going to talk about. Um does anyone have any like last comments or uh questions or anything? No, nothing. Okay, yeah. In that case, I'll probably send out um, a doodle. Um, yeah, well, I might send out a doodle for next week. Oh, yeah, Maggie, you were going to say something? Or... Uh, no, that's not going to be Okay, I'm um, sure. So, yeah, I'll send out a doodle uh, probably for, yeah, next Tuesday again. Uh, we'll try to uh, meet then. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Tuesday, um, yeah, Tuesday, Friday, we'll keep our schedule. Um, I know we did cancel one or two meetings, um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's still good to try to meet, uh, twice a week. Um, even if it's just for people that can't make, uh, all the meetings. Um, so yeah, I did, uh, do people... Actually, do people want to do a doodle, or would they rather just schedule something now? So, I think doodle is fine, uh, especially for the people who are not here today. Okay, yeah, then 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 I'll send a doodle, um, and I'll try to send it soon. Actually, if we had an automated workflow that just sent out a doodle, that would be helpful but i can add um i can add it soon okay so yeah i think that uh, covers uh everything have a have a good weekend and good rest of your day thank you likewise thank you Bye. great presentation yeah. okay right